It's early afternoon of the 26th of March, 1942. Three destroyers, accompanied by almost two dozen motor torpedo boats and motor launchers, with a battalion-sized unit of British commandos aboard, depart from the port of Falmouth. Their mission, to hinder the ability of German battleships to operate in the Northern Atlantic. One of the most audacious and spectacular raids of the Second World War is about to begin. It's the middle of January, 1942. The German battleship Tirpitz, the sister ship of the famed but short-lived Bismarck, sails into Trondheim Fjord in occupied Norway. Her mission is to both threaten the Arctic convoys, providing supplies to the Soviet Union, and also strengthen the German defense against a suspected British assault of Norway. Deployment of the Tirpitz to Scandinavia caused a significant amount of distress within the British Admiralty and for Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who believed that destroying or at least crippling the German battleship was among the chief objectives of the Royal Navy in early 1942. While one arm of the Admiralty sketched plans on how to destroy the Tirpitz anchored in Norway, another group worked on possible countermeasures in case the German battleship ever ventured out into the Atlantic. Several bigger vessels of the British home fleet were kept at the ready in Scarpa Fleur for such an eventuality. But the Bismarck incident had shown that the presence of British battleships in the area could do little to discourage the Germans from using the Tirpitz as a commerce raider. Thus, the Admiralty planners came up with another idea to diminish the threat posed by the German Leviathan. Since the Tirpitz was a vessel of enormous size, not every dry dock was big enough to accommodate the ship in the case of it being damaged and in dire need of repairs. In fact, the only facility on the Atlantic coast capable of servicing the Tirpitz was located in the German-occupied port of Saint-Nazaire in western France. If the local dockyard was somehow disabled or hopefully even destroyed, that would most likely dissuade the Kriegsmarine from risking the Tirpitz in the Atlantic. At first, the British thought that a wave of air raids could render the port inoperable, but several months later, the command of the Royal Air Force realized that damaging the dock to a sufficient extent with bombing raids was virtually impossible, especially given the strong ring of anti-aircraft weapons around saint Nazaire and the added risk of harming the civil population. Another way to disable the dock had to be found. Eventually, it was decided that a well-executed amphibious assault using a formation of British commandos would be a more effective way to complete the task. The details of this operation were entrusted to Churchill's protege, Lord Louis Mountbatten, at the time serving as Chief of Combined Operations. Yet this assignment turned out to be far more difficult than it first seemed. While sabotaging most of the port facilities in a quick surprise raid was doable under favorable conditions, destroying the dock gates was a completely different matter. Achieving this required a huge amount of explosives and was simply beyond the capabilities of a single commando battalion. But the planners soon came up with another idea. An old US-built destroyer serving in the Royal Navy, the HMS Campbelltown, was to be modified to look like a German torpedo boat and being laden with explosives used to ram the dry docks outer gates at night. This plan was initially met with some opposition within the Admiralty leaders and the officers of the Royal Navy. But in the beginning of March 1942, Operation Chariot, as it was dubbed, was approved. Extensive training of the troops began even before the plan was authorized and both the commandos and the sailors spent weeks in training to gain the required proficiency in demolitions and urban combat, learning the nuances of the port installation in saint Nazaire at the same time. Concurrently, the HMS Campbelltown underwent some vital modifications. Two of her four funnels were removed, along with all unnecessary equipment. Some extra armor plating was added should the Germans recognize the ploy and take fire at the vessel. Finally, the modified HMS Campbelltown arrived at Falmouth in Cornwall, from where the entire group of three destroyers and almost 20 smaller craft departed in the afternoon of the 26th of March, steaming south. The beginning of the mission went as planned, but on the early morning of the next day, the British flotilla met its first problems. While passing Brittany, 
they were accidentally spotted by a German U-boat. The group opened fire, quickly forcing the enemy to submerge and retreat. The whole operation could have been compromised before it had even begun, as the U-boat's captain relayed his sighting to German command. But because the British were traveling directly south and not along the French coast, German command assessed that the flotilla was not an immediate threat, possibly heading to Gibraltar, and took no action to intercept. In the evening, the group reached a checkpoint around 65 nautical miles off Saint-Nazaire, where they changed course towards the Loire estuary, leaving their destroyer escort behind. The German naval ensign was flown on the modified HMS Campbellton to further liken it to the German Rabfugel class torpedo boat as the group closed the distance to Saint-Nazaire. At about midnight, 90 minutes before the planned attack, the monotonous drone of the British bombers over the city heralded a bombing raid, preparing ground for the commando assault. The night was lit up with the flashes of explosions, but thick cloud cover foiled the effectiveness of this attack. To make the bombing even harder, the Germans extinguished their searchlights in the port, fearing the bomber crews would use them to locate their targets. In the meantime, the convoy entered the Loire estuary. Using the advantage of high tide, the HMS Campbelltown could avoid sailing through the constantly patrolled main shipping channel and use the ordinarily more difficult path of shoals and mudflats. The British flotilla was already about a few kilometers from the dock gates, steadily sailing through the mouth of Loire. The Germans used a naval signal light to demand the identification of the incoming vessel. But the sailors aboard the Campbelltown managed to maintain the disguise by using an intercepted German short signal book. For a time, this ploy confused the crews of the shore batteries, buying valuable time for the British. But the deception didn't last and eventually every German gun in the bay opened fire on the British vessel. The Campbelltown, blinded by searchlights and shelled from every side, increased her speed to 19 knots and changed course straight to the dock gates. The shore batteries scored multiple hits but were unable to stop the destroyer. Eventually, the British ship rammed the gates, thrusting about 10 meters into the dock and crumpling her bow while the destroyer tilted upward. The commando squads hastily disembarked the wrecked Campbelltown, leaping onto the dock to engage the Germans in the port. Other British motor launchers and motor torpedo boats were already landing their complements, beginning the second phase of the raid. A standard firefight ensued as the British commandos struggled to destroy their anti-aircraft guns and provide cover for the demolition squads attempting to blow up the pumping stations and as much of the port infrastructure as possible. The raid proceeded more or less as planned, but the German units in the town were able to quickly reorganize and, with the support of an infantry regiment that joined the engagement at 2 a.m., put massive pressure on the British commandos. As a result, within the next couple of hours, the raiders were pushed back to the docks and many British were either killed or wounded. The retreat was made even more difficult as many of the landing boats were sunk and only a fraction of the landing squads managed to evacuate. The last of the British soldiers who were cornered in the town were overwhelmed by the next morning. The losses on the raider side were staggering. Almost 170 of the Royal Navy sailors and commandos perished in the attack, while some 200 more were taken prisoner. This, however, was not the end of Operation Chariot. Shortly past 10 a.m., German officers were investigating the damage caused by the British destroyer. The wreck also attracted a considerable number of infantrymen, as a rumor spread that the ship was provisioned with a hefty amount of liquor and cigarettes. It was then that the detonators aboard the HMS Campbelltown ignited more than four tons of death charges and a violent explosion shook the port, killing more than 300 soldiers and civilians. The detonators were meant to trigger the explosion five hours earlier, but despite the delay, the ultimate goal of the raid was achieved. The huge dry dock in San Nazir was completely destroyed and was beyond repair up until the end of the war. The amphibious attack on San Nazir port was quickly picked up by the British propaganda as a great victory over German hegemony. 
Though the British commandos and sailors conceded significant losses and failed to destroy some of the port facilities, the most important target, the dry dock, was put out of commission for several years. Thanks to their sacrifice, the possible area of operation for the German battleship Tirpitz was significantly reduced and further tipped the balance in the favor of the British in the ongoing battle of the Atlantic.